so David, of course, is the former MP of um, Cambridge, and um, I give the floor to him. Thanks, Josh. Um, so I was the MP six years ago. I was last on the City Council 12 years ago, and I was leader of the City Council 13 years ago. So I have absolutely no knowledge of the current state of play of the devolution proposed in the East or in Cambridge, and don't claim to have any particular insights in So um, since I'm now Professor of Law and Public Policy, I thought I'd just talk about the policy as it seems to me from more the national point of view. Um, and the subtitle of this talk kind of gives away what I think, how not to design a policy. So how do you design a good policy? Well, um, you can draw lessons from <coughs> all sorts of places, but I like to draw lessons from um, designers in general, engineers, architects, people in that sort of profession. And what they say is to um, design something that's good and effective and works. There are a number of, uh, of, of general rules which uh, help to increase the probability of success. They don't guarantee success, but they help you on the way. Um, the first is your objectives have to be clear. They have to be coherent. If there are conflicting objectives, you've got to sort them out before you start the design. If there are trade-offs to be made between different objectives, you have to specify what they are before you start designing, not afterwards. Second is, um, if you want to find solutions that work, you've got to look for mechanisms that work. There's no point in uh, designing with mechanisms that don't work at all, or which are unreliable. So if you want to light a, a, a building, it's not a good idea to think that the best way to do it is to start with matches and start sort of flicking matches for, for little bits of light. And if you want, um, um, it, it, it also you need to think very strongly, carefully about what the problem really is, as opposed to what it looks like. And so, so the next um, uh, important aspect of the design is that you should specify the problem very carefully before starting to design. That's to say, you need to conceptually separate the problem from the solution. That's how you think, you think of lots of different possible solutions and get to a rational answer, as opposed to um, um, obsessing about particular solutions, which then will cut you off from particular from, from good solutions. So as engineers often say, if someone comes to you and says, um, um, I want a better garage door, you say, well, why do you want a better garage door? And they say, oh, my car keeps being nicked. And then you start to think about good ways of preventing thefts of cars, which might not in in involve doors of garages. Right, so you've got to separate the problem from the solutions and try to produce solutions that work um, to solve the problem and not to obsess about particular solutions. Next thing is that um, when assessing a possible solution, you should go back to the original problem. You should solve that one, not some other one. And one of the problems in design <coughs> is that there's drift in objectives, that people start on set of objectives. And as the um, debate goes on about what the solution is, the, the objectives start getting lost and people start thinking about other objectives instead. If you do that, you'll never solve the problem starting. And finally, <coughs> one thing the engineers in particular do is that they uh, look at the design and uh, has chosen, and they say, well, are there particular points of this design which are vulnerabilities? Are there single points of failure? Elements, if they fail, the whole thing fails. And if you've got single points of failure, you should try and design around or design that. So, if you apply that to um, uh, the devolution proposals that we've been talking about all day, what do you get? Well, this is what I think it is. You've got unclear and contradictory objectives. The chosen mechanisms, at least one of them, uh, doesn't work. In fact, none of them work. Um, the design is obsessed with one solution, the men. There have been ad hoc shifts in objectives which confuse the whole project and confuse assessment of uh, whether the solutions are good ones. And there are two, I'll get on to what they are, obvious single points of failure in the design. 
So just briefly, I want to go through all five of those. We'll just, we'll just kind of minute each of them, you know, if I can. Um, here are all the objectives that I've managed, managed to uh, track down in the Heseltine report and in Greg Clark's speech on the second reading of the bill in 2015. Um, so we've got all sorts of things. Um, in the earlier talk, they said it was only economic performance. Well, economic performance keeps coming back, but all these other things are there as well. Um, coordination of public services, health and social services often mentioned, accountability by clarifying who has responsibility for local decisions, speed has been mentioned, so that, that's also on the list, improving public engagement, increasing the power of local government. And there are also some kind of what you call negative objectives, you know, things you don't want to happen. And they're a bit more input, not really spoken about, but they're implying what's going on. So one is that um, the new system shouldn't cost any more than the old system. Um, another is that the new system should be at least as honest and uncorrupt as the existing system. And third, which, which Greg Clark did sort of say in Parliament, that national accountability, especially for the NHS, but for all national services, should continue. Right? So this is the set of objectives we've got. And just try and think about whether they make sense together. Um, increasing speed, for example, isn't really compatible with increasing public engagement. Um, in national accountability, but maintaining national accountability for the NHS um, isn't really compatible with the goal of clarifying accountability. And so on. You can just go through these pair by pair, and you'll see there are lots of contradictions. And they haven't been clarified. They're just one of the ways politics works is that when someone says, well, will it do some other thing, people say, yes, of course. They try and justify the proposal in terms of the new objective, rather than saying, no, we won't do that. And we have to sort out where we are between conflicting objectives. Unreliable mechanisms. This is the worst problem. Um, the starting point here is a paper that was done for the Joseph Rowntree Foundation in 2005 and made the rounds of Whitehall in 2006 when I was a shadow of local government minister. So everybody in Whitehall knows about it. Um, it's a paper by um, Hartley, Leach, Hartley and, uh, and other people on local government, government structures. And what they found was that government structures, mayors, leaders, committee systems, whatever, make no difference at all to the quality of local leadership. The quality of local leadership is all about the quality of the people in it, which is uh, much more things that Lou said about. You know, it all depends on who puts themselves forward from there. It's the quality of the individuals, their strategic ability, their political ability, their administrative ability, their managerial ability. And you can find you know, good mayors and bad mayors, good leaders, councillors, bad leaders, councillors, and so on. The structure doesn't matter. Second, um, speed of delivery. We had one example, Leicester, where the mayor thinks it's faster. If you look at the latest figures on pla major planning applications that DCLG published in June, uh, and you separate out the mayoral councils and the non-mayoral councils, yes, there is a tiny difference in speed. The mayoral councils, 17% um, of major applications go over the 13-week time limit. Non-mayoral councils, 19.6 go over. So, yeah, that's an advantage. It's not very robust. I doubt whether it'll be the same in every year. It might reverse in some years. It's a kind of small and possibly non-existent advantage. Um, turnouts in elections. Well, uh, the, uh, the great gurus of local elections, Ryan and Thrasher, uh, David Cowling in this case, uh, studied turnouts in local elections in mayoral against non-mayoral councils, and they found no difference at all. And in fact, if mayor elections happen out of season, that is not in the May uh, electoral uh, 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 timing for council elections, the mayor election turnouts are massively lower. Um, now, someone I think mentioned in the audience that uh, a greater profile, and that's the one thing there is evidence for. Um, Fenwick and Alcock found, or well, at least report other people finding, that um, mayors do get more coverage on the local media than council leaders. Although well, that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's quite an interesting question. Um, <laughs> and what they're getting coverage for is also an interesting question. So I can tell you the mayor of Tower Hamlets wasn't getting very good coverage. Um, next, a, a very important point um, from, from a bit of my own research. Who is the accountability 
of a, an elected mayor too. And so I should report a conversation I had with a, an elected mayor who, rather like Peter Salisbury, had been a council leader. And I said, well, what's the difference between being a council leader and being a mayor? And the answer is that if you're a council leader, you're very, very, very interested in what your group thinks, because they have the power to throw you out. Right? Just like prime minister, you need ongoing, continuing confidence from your own side. If you're a mayor, who are you interested in? Well, of course, the theory is you're interested in the wider electorate. But the reality is, as reported to me by this one particular mayor, you are interested in the selectorate, in your party, in the people who can vote on your reselection. And in the era of momentum, that's a very interesting thing uh, to be the case. Um, finally, um, extra tiers of local government. Um, the Treasury itself found in 2007 a joint study with two other departments that extra tiers of local government simply do not help economic development, which is kind of obvious, but it's nice to have someone study it. Um, next, the obsession with mayors. This single solution that gets in the way of thinking about other solutions and gets in the way of implementing solutions we know work. So what do we know about how you improve GDP growth, for example, by adjusting public expenditure? Well, the research on that suggests that what's important is education spending, and in developed countries, especially education spending on tertiary education, universities. Um, infrastructure spending is very important, um, because the deals do include infrastructure spending. But why obstruct that infrastructure spending by insisting on some particular mechanism? It just slows the whole thing down. You can still spend any um, And then the third thing, which has got nothing to do with these deals at all, is the elimination of production subsidies. And of course, that's what we're going back to in national politics now, is with production subsidies. Um, the nuclear industry and possibly the car industry we don't know arising out of Brexit. So what about political engagement? Well, what, what uh, increases turnouts, what everyone in politics knows, is competitive election. The more competitive the election, the higher the turnout. That's just you know, an obvious fact. And perhaps the electoral system is involved in that as well. Right, different electoral systems, just safe seats and so on, um, uh, depress the turnout. Coherence in government is often mentioned, um, and of course you can improve coherence both by centralizing it and by decentralizing it. Yeah. So, so, so there are other options. Yeah. Increasing the power of local government, well, we've already heard some of the other ways in which you can do that. You can increase local government's taxation powers, you can remove appeals on planning, for example, you can get rid of conditions on the ground. Right. So all sorts of ways of doing that, um, which don't um, involve mayors. And if you really want to include speed, there are all sorts of terrible things you can do. Um, um, automatically giving people permission if the time limit is exceeded, um, getting rid of just local discretion, there are all sorts of ways in which you can include speed, which are totally incompatible with decentralization and engaging the public in local government. So this, this obsession with mayors is getting in the way of policy development. And also, getting in the way of the implementation of policies that work, like infrastructure spending. Why is this? Well, this is the thing I could go on for hours about what I've got. Why is there this obsession with mayors? What is this stuff? You know, is it to do with an obsession with the USA, like the, the so-called West Wing obsession, where national politicians in Britain spend all their time watching the West Wing and wishing they were in it? And then they say, oh, there's, there's, there's Rahm Emanuel, he's the mayor of Chicago. Maybe that's the answer. Um, is it the theory that business does things better than government? So you have autocratic you know, CEOs in business who can get things done, is that the theory? Or is it celebrity politics? I kind of fear it's celebrity politics. Um, you know, the idea that, that um, politics should be part of entertainment. Well, more than that. Um, and of course you're in the Cambridge politics department where nothing can be said without Hobbes being brought into it. Um, there is a kind of Hobbesianism as well that's going on. The obsession with single person government. The idea that single person government is better partly because they can get advice in secret and they can choose their own advice on the basis of 
merits or whatever they want, not on the basis of these other people being elected and causing more noise. But overall, uh, but above all, because the theory that single people are decisive, that they, they're not divided against themselves, although it's obvious that Hobbes never met Boris Johnson. <laughs> Or Hamlet. Or Hamlet, <laughs> although he wasn't the king though, he was just a prince. Um, lots of focus on objectives, um, spend lots on this as well, but just briefly, one of the things you notice in the devolution business is all sorts of new problems being added as the process goes on. So the one I've noticed is the um, accretion to the role of mayor of the role of crime police commissioner. And this is, I think, especially happening in um, Manchester. Um, and you start to wonder what the relevance of the mayor also being the police and crime commissioner is to economic development. I can't really understand why that's what it should be the case. Uh, but also, is that a good idea, this collection of powers, from the point of view of integrity? Do we really want one person to be in charge of the criminal justice system and everything else in the local government place? That sounds dangerous. I also don't want to go on about the Mayor of Tower Hamlets again, but I just mentioned that in passing. Finally, single points of failure. There are two obvious single points of failure. One is the Mayor him or herself. If the Mayor is useless or dangerous, how do you get rid of them? And there's only one way, that's through the law. There's no democratic institutional way of doing it. They just hang on until you remove them through the courts which is extremely painful and expensive. The second single point of failure is the treasury. And you will notice that the financial settlements for these deals, that they've got both long and short-term aspects to them. Long-term aspects, you know, promises for 30 years for the money. And then short-term aspects like the, the, the Cambridge housing money, which is a kind of one-off button. Um, the problem with the long-term settlements is that they are not enforceable. The Treasury doesn't have to do it. It can change its mind. And you know, if any, anyone goes through political life trusting the Treasury, they're not going to do very well. The short term money, well, you might get your hands on that, that that's perhaps a bit more reliable, but there isn't very much of it, and it's a bump. It's just being used to smooth agreement to the mayors. And so the chances of being repeated are very low. And also the Treasury is the Treasury. What does the Treasury do when it finds some ministries given some money away they didn't really want? It gets it back some other way. So even in the medium term, these um, these extra bits of funding, useful though they might be, might tend to might be wiped out by further changes in funding arrangements. So in the medium long term the Treasury can turn them off and it can turn the screw. And that's an obvious single point of failure for the entire scheme. So what's my conclusion? Well, obviously, this is a very badly designed uh, bit of policy. Um, but I suppose I agree in the end with um, Fenwick and Alcock, who say this, um, this entire policy has not been a disaster. It's not going to be a catastrophe. It's just a bit of a non-event. That nothing really ever happens and everyone comes away from it um, in the end with a feeling that um, nothing much happened there and perhaps we've just been wasting our time for the past decade trying to get something moving that didn't really make any difference. That's